we can start, I think, um, which it's, I mean, yeah, it's fun doing this because there are some really smart people that are attending the conference and uh, know a lot about this stuff. So um, let's start with the, if you have access to the uh, replit, this is a funny, workshop to have a replit for because I'm basically just going through a bunch of blog posts and, and mailing list entries. But, um, so we can talk about who I am first. So my name is Bob Crowley. I'm a software engineer at Unchained Capital. We do uh, collaborative custody, so Bitcoin financial services, uh, all built on top of, um, on top of multi-sig. It's not really directly related to what we're going to talk about today, but we do have to deal with fees um, a bit. Um, I do some work on Lightning stuff on the side. I've been really interested in LSATs, which are Lightning Service Authentication Tokens, essentially a way to do um, uh, userless authentication using Lightning payments, and built a few tools for that. Um, what we're going to do today is Socratic seminar style. So another thing about me is I'm, I'm Austin based. I'm a co-host of Austin Bit Devs uh, here. So we do on the third Thursday of every month, we host uh, basically Socratic seminar like what we're gonna be doing today, where we go over the latest news of the past uh, month in the development ecosystem in Bitcoin and a bit on Lightning. And so that's kind of what we're, what the idea of this workshop is. We're going to do this Socratic seminar style. So a uh, show of hands, who's been to a Bitcoin Socratic seminar? Okay. Yeah, I just did. Exactly. Um, all right. So just to reiterate, the kind of, the idea is effectively to have a conversation about the topics. So I'm not an expert on any of these. Um, I just try and read through the content and understand it. I do work it with some of this stuff, but um, there are other greater experts on these things. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this as kind of one of these like staged workshop things is there's gonna be a lot of talks tomorrow where this will be background knowledge to kind of understand those other topics. So um, for example, one of the, the core developers that's done a lot of work on fixing the kind of like state of fees is Gloria Zhao. She'll be doing a talk on kind of like the latest solution that we've gone, we've gotten to. It hasn't been yet deployed, but it should be close for that. So this is a, a chance to like have some background on how all this stuff works. Um, and yes, it's kind of crazy that I volunteer to just talk and give a presentation for four hours. So. Um, Ideally, this is a conversation people are, are, are filling in, answering questions, asking questions, and we can have a discussion. Idea is to have uh, Chatham House rules as well so that we can have controversial opinions, although I'm being live streamed, so my controversial opinions will be public. Um, but everyone else, I, I'll try not to say your name and, and you should be good. All right. Um, so typically, like I said, what, what I do for these is we're going through a range of topics um, based off of what's happening in the month. But this, we're going to focus on a particular topic, and this is uh, fee management. So as was just said a little bit earlier, this has kind of been a contentious topic on, on many different dimensions. Uh, part of it is um, the problems in general, the solutions, how to deploy the solutions, um, soft fork policy, uh, does policy even count? Uh, you know, is zero comp okay and safe? Blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot to cover. Um, but this is particularly relevant to layer twos. Um, and uh, does anybody want to like take a stab or, or talk about why like fees are challenging for layer two protocols? Or maybe just start off first, like why fees are challenging to begin with in Bitcoin? Right, it's not like routing fees, correct, yeah. But those, of course, like play into the layer twos as well, yeah. So this is layer one fees, like what, what the mempool sees, or what you, so yeah, it's dealing with the mempool, um, but also like that, the implications of that for layer twos. Because we need to uh, kind of dance with everybody else that's also using the protocol and do it in a way where you don't spend all of your money. You don't know if that's everybody else is trying to do. 
just have to guess and try and you just do your best. But then it's kind of unsatisfying because there's no good way to know ahead of time uh, what the appropriate key is. Yeah. And the only way to do it is to get experience, really. Yeah. Well, and another, I, I, I like this saying where there is no the mempool, there's many mempools, right? So even like knowing what the mempool looks like is yeah. basically impossible. Yeah. Um, so that's that's another challenge. Um, uh, y yes. Uh, Um, that's one of the challenges. How much you have available. And to play off on that a little bit, guessing what there is in the future. So one of the challenges for, uh, with these four layer two protocols is a lot of the ways that layer two protocols work is essentially with pre-signed transactions. So lightning is you go into a contract with another person and yada, yada, yada. If somebody cheats, you have this pre-signed transaction that lets you punish the person that tried to cheat. It's a pre-signed transaction ahead of time. So when you're signing that transaction, forming that transaction, you have no idea what the fee market at the time when that person's trying to cheat is gonna look like. So if you don't know what that's gonna look like, you need a way to react to, those, to, to, to that problem. Um, another situation is, is just kind of like, you really don't know how it might look from day to day. Uh, we get some better idea, but like the way that the mempool started looking when inscriptions came out, nobody really guessed that it was gonna be like that. And um, that impacts a lot of people, right? And you, you have user behavior, people are used to doing a certain thing, um, and then all of a sudden they see their transactions not getting confirmed for a few days, like what the heck is going on? That can have business implications as well. Um, another tricky thing with fees is just how they're calculated. Does anybody, know how fees are, like, how you pay fees in Bitcoin? Yeah, exactly. So they're implicit to transactions. You subtract the, the outputs from the inputs, whatever's left over just goes to fees. It's kind of funny because you, can, you look at a transaction, there's no field for fees in that transaction. And if you're using the Bitcoin D API, they'll serialize it for you, but it just does that from, from that, you know, arithmetic. What's also funny is that the miners, it doesn't necessarily go to the miner. The miner just chooses to like give themselves those fees. So there are, there have been blocks where the fees just end up getting burnt. Um, you can't, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. Yeah, that was, and also pre-segwit, we weren't committing to that as well, right? So um, yeah, even, yeah, even more complicated. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a mess. Um, yeah, there were some, there were some attacks that are actually are still applicable even with SegWit, but SegWit made it harder to do where you could, uh, if you have multiple people signing, I should have actually had this, this is an interesting one with fees, but um, you could switch out inputs that change the values and because prior to SegWit we weren't committing to values, you could make the fees, uh, you can make the, basically burn a lot of fees in that protocol and, and screw somebody else over in that transaction, which is really interesting. Um, I, there's this, this great error message in Bitcoin D just called uh, absurdly high fee. Um, it's like, yo, dude, I think you did something wrong here, um, which is funny because you, again, you, it's not explicit. So if you have a wallet that does coin selection incorrectly, um, calculates change incorrectly, um, then you can accidentally, um, pay too much in fees. So nodes try and check for that. Cool. All right. So we'll go over a little bit about how fee management works today. So there's two primary ways to account for the ways that, like, if, if, if you underpaid fees and a transaction gets stuck. So the first one we can talk about is RBF. Who knows what RBF is? Yeah. Do you want to explain how it works? Replaced by fee? Also, 
so the miners will, uh, will I guess, they theoretically uh, prefer to uh, process the trips actually at a higher speed so that it will also get kind of safe for everyone. Yeah. One of the challenges with fees in general is, um, so there is, Space in the mempool is free, basically, right? So the way that Satoshi um, kind of solves the, the double spend problem is also like, if you are going to do something and it gets put in a block, those, those fees are spent, right? Um, but it's free, essentially, to broadcast the transaction to a node. And so one of the things that the de developers wanted to do with uh, replace by fee, where basically you had this transaction in there, and you want to double spend the UTXO. So we don't let, we don't allow double spending in blocks. If uh, there's a transaction that's double spending UTXOs that have already been mined, that's rejected by everybody, miners and, and nodes. But there is no the mempool, there's no consensus in mempool. We talk about that as being policy rather than consensus. Um, so anybody can double spend, the UT theoretically, like absent any policy rules, can double spend UTXOs an infinite number of times. That takes up bandwidth from transactions that legitimately are trying to get to miners at no cost to the person that is sending those transactions. So the idea with um, RBF, basically RBF has five rules. And the first one is signaling, so that way, uh, which is kind of like changing now, you can opt to not uh, honor, or you basically will allow any transaction to be replaced, whether it's signaling or not. Um, that's full RBF, and it's, still like not fully deployed on the network because uh, it's opt-in. The rest of the rules are kind of focused around um, either DOS, DDoS protection, making sure that you know transactions have to pay for the space that they're replacing and taking up. That way, if you were to, if you were to try to do this infinitely, you'd have to keep on adding fees. And if you're continually adding fees, like that will cost you, so it costs every time you're trying to replace it, which, you know, sounds reasonable in theory. Um, and the other thing that we're trying to do is solve for, uh, just make these as minor incentive compatible as possible. So the whole point of the mempool is to basically get the most ec economical transactions, or the most incentive compatible transactions to the miners as possible, to get them the most fees. So. Um, we have these five rules. Rule number two, replace the transaction may only include unconfirmed. Oh, this is a weird one that uh, Gloria Jow and some of her proposals just wants to get rid of, um, and we should be there soon. Um, so replacement transaction may only include an unconfirmed input if that input was included in one of the original transactions. So you're replacing a transaction. Obviously, those inputs are un unconfirmed, but you can't basically, we're about to talk about child pays for parent. You can't do that. Uh, with RBF for some reason. I don't, does anyone know why they did that? Yeah. <laughs> um, meh, but it's the rule for some reason. Um, this is the big one, and we'll talk about this in a second. So rule three uh, is the cause of a lot of the pinning attacks uh, that we'll talk about in a second, and it's that the replacement transaction pays an absolute fee of at least the sum paid by the original transactions. If you have a chain of transactions that you're replacing uh, and you're bumping one out, you have to pay for all of those. Um, and then the replace the transaction must also pay for its own bandwidth. Um, so let's say minimum relay fee is one Satoshi by byte per byte. The replacement transaction is 500 bytes total. The replacement must pay a fee at least 500 Satoshis higher than the sum of the originals. So. Um, make sure you're not, t you're, you're paying for, the, again, this is like one of the DDoS protections. Uh, this is another one that does cause some problems. Uh, you can have pinnings as a result of this. Basically, the number of original transactions to be replaced and their descend descendants that will be evicted must not exceed a total of 100 transactions. So if you're in a multi-party um, uh, transaction, multi-party contract, and an att the, the other party is an attacker, they can basically pin that transaction so it can't be replaced by chaining 100 transactions off of that. So, um, yeah, it just wouldn't be evicted from that. It's not a key to 12 of 100 transactions. Um, so that's RBF. Um, and this causes some problems, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, 
Uh, there's something else that's, that's discussed in the, um, in the original BIP, which I thought was interesting. It's just like, hey, we've lived without RBF for a while, and now there are certain user behaviors that we kind of have to contend with. And so the BIP gives some suggestions for how wallets should be designed to account for them. So uh, basically convey additional suspicion about opt-in full RBF to the user or data consumer. So if you're receiving uh, a transaction that has RBF enabled, the suggestion is tell the user that uh, this transaction might be replaced and don't trust it yet. And then uh, another option that they, they say is, I've heard this before, is like maybe it was just a mistake to show pending at all um, because it's not final until it gets mined. That's problematic. Like, you know, it's easy to say in theory, but if you're running any sort of anything that is operating that, um, like even the fact that there's, this happens with us sometimes, like sometimes our mempool, um, our node won't see a particular transaction uh, right away and the exchange it, or the exchange of the block explorers will see it and a customer will say, hey, I deposited it and it's not showing off. It's like, yeah, no, you just gotta wait. It's like, it's coming, we promise, but you know, sorry. So like, you don't want more of those support requests. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. The biggest problem in Bitcoin businesses is having customers. So the advice I've heard is try not to have customers. <laughs> I mean, it's great for us, but it's like, yeah, I mean, it's great in theory to talk about like all the things you should and shouldn't do. It's like, all right, try having customers and then tell me and then, then we can talk. Um, <laughs> uh, so what's interesting as well is so opt-in full RBF uses Satoshi's original semantics with a slight tweak. So um, Basically, the, um, the field that's used to signal, uh, there's a field that now we're coming up with new use cases for. I really like any prev out for this because you use it to sequence transactions. The original idea was there's this field that you can say which um, sequence of transactions coming in. And you say, oh, actually, this is transaction number two, so it should replace transaction number one. It's basically unenforceable. It's not incentive compatible, so bad idea, so we opted out. Any prev out actually lets you do that at kind of a higher level, so which is kind of cool. But that's not, we're not gonna talk about that here. Um, all right, so RBF. Uh, who knows what CPFP is? Child pays for parent. Exactly, right. So as the name says, child pays for parent. The idea being that, except in that weird case for RBF, um, a transaction can spend an unconfirmed UTXO. So you have this transaction that's been sitting in the mempool for a while because it's not paying enough fees. There is a UTXO there that's trying to get mined. If you have another transaction that spends that UTXO, now, the only way, and that, let's say the parent transaction is paying two, two sets per V-byte, but the, um, so, and that's getting stuck in the mempool. And then you put another transaction that the rate doesn't matter as much, but um, just for comparison's sake, we say, okay, it's paying uh, 50 sets per V-byte. And the average right now in the mempool is 20 pa uh, sets per, per V-byte. But that's spending an unconfirmed output. The only way you can get the fees from the child since it's spending this unconfirmed output is to mine the parent first. So the parent gets in the block, then the child gets in the block, the miner gets the fees for both. So that's really useful. You can do that in any wallet that gives you a certain amount of coin control. Um, so as long as you can pick the inputs that go into a transaction that you wanna spend, this is pretty easy to do. Um, for normal transactions, if you're assuming that the majority of like normally authored transactions are gonna have some form of change, you, even if you're paying to somebody else, you're always gonna have a UTXO that you control in that um, transaction. So you just have to spend that change um, in a follow-on transaction and you can fee bump even without opting into RBF or anything like that. Pretty cool. But we have some problems in uh, layer two. So uh, that's where the CPFP carve out uh, for, um, comes in for Lightning. Does anybody 
uh, have some understanding or, or history with that. It wants to explain what the CPFP carve out or anchor outputs is another way to think about it. And that, yeah, they don't know if they're going to win the yeah, child block. So. Yeah, so the miners will say, no, I, I only use CPFT if it's a pilot for both of them. And if one of the rules is you have to wait a block or 100 blocks for the two users, then you just can't do both of them. So they put new outputs that don't have any kind of predictive just for the two players. Yeah, and you have one output for each participant because you don't know who the attacker is, and each participant in a multi party protocol needs to be able to fee bump because you don't know who the attacker is going to be. Um, right, so this was outlined back in 2018 uh, by uh, Lightning developer Matt Corallo, Boom Matt on Twitter. Um, he goes through this and this was just implied in the explanation we just heard, um, but I think it's really, it's really useful to, to, to think about in this framing. This attack does, does not have to be permanent to work. Lightning security model assumes the ability to get such commitment transactions confirmed in a timely manner, right? So if we think about how Lightning in the current um, construction works, it's that if somebody tries to cheat, um, you have this justice transaction that will take all the funds away from the cheater. And you basically have until the timeout to, uh, to um, enforce that justice transaction. But what if an attacker is able to get, the get that transaction stuck for the number of blocks um, until that timeout happens? Okay, well now you're shit out of luck. So, uh, right. But the HTLC ones do that. It's, and, and you never know, like that, that's the thing too, is there are some circumstances where the, the block space can be so, or the, the mempool can be so out of control and can happen very quickly. Um, but here's another way that, that that can happen is when L&D went down and you, you weren't seeing blocks as they were getting mined. And we were like, I think a few hours away from when like the average uh, timeouts were going to be hit um, so that the HTLCs could have actually um, been broadcast if you had any pending transactions. So they, they suggested like lightning could still work even if you're not seeing the blocks. Uh, but if somebody sticks, uh, it doesn't really, it, the incentives break, but if all of your nodes are routing properly, you're fine. But if one of them is not being honest, these HTLCs are in flight, they get stuck, then um, this can kind of be exploited. And so we got pretty close to that. I think a lot, I think all the implementations bumped up their defaults for the timeouts as a result, um, uh, which is good. Um, so yeah, so it, I think it's just really interesting for a lot of these fee-based attacks. Uh, you know, DLCs is another area where you have to worry about this. It's not one of, like the ways that these protocols work is by making them incentive compatible and one of the ways that they do that is through time locks and for the attacks to work, they don't have to work forever. You don't have to seal directly, you just have to wait long enough um, for them to happen. So um, basically, yes, um, as was mentioned, the anchor outputs uh, or carve out is these commitment transactions um, have these, uh, two small value outputs that have to be above the dust limit as well so that they're valid, uh, that are immediately spendable so that either participant can uh, CPFP it if necessary to fee bump. Uh, there's some issues also like RBF um, 
there's, there's pinning vulnerabilities with RBF for Lightning, which is why they have to use uh, CPFP instead of uh, RBF. So an another challenge. Uh, for contracting applications like Lightning, this means that as long as a transaction we wish to confirm, so the commitment transaction has only two immediately spendable outputs, each immediately spendable output is only spendable by one counterparty at a time, and then you limit the size um, to um, uh, not break some of the, oh yeah, so the, not, not break some of the other rules. So an alternative proposal was uh, around solving RBF pinning, but we've been having that discussion for years now. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there's a few downsides to this. Does anybody have any complaints about, about this? It's good, we need it, given the state of, of things now, but um, it's not ideal. You can't disable. You can, but like nothing works. Like they don't test it. So it's just, <laughs> and then it's like, you don't need these data stores to do these modifications to make those things work if you want. And, you know, if it's bad, all of this stuff is, you know, there's a pop up that says it's too expensive. You know, it, it, it sort of starts blowing up all the time. Yeah. Taking up extra train space is not nice. I, that's a, it's a really good point because that's problematic with any of the fee bumping stuff is you basically have to keep UTXOs around um, because the way you fee bump, well, since fees are implicit, it's with the inputs and the outputs, there's two ways to increase fees. You can decrease the amount of an output or you increase the input values, the, the total input value. So, um, and because inputs are, are done by UTXOs, you have to have a UTXO to, to add on to, which means you always have to have enough left over and uh, and I guess you, you have to do it in the right way because how do you do, can you also add the output for the change? Yeah, it's true for RBF as well. But overall, it's making the problem much worse. I would say that's true for RBF as well. It's just like we're solving one problem. Well, I guess it's not making the same problem worse, right? So you're not making the same problem worse, but you are making other problems with yeah, RBF. Exactly. I mean, I personally don't like that part. It's like, uh, right. you know, slug the run tool. I, I sort of have a... I'm more thinking about the pinning attacks and things like that. And then like the solutions to the pinning is just like, oh, there's this other uh, attack that comes in if you try and solve that. But I think that's a good, that, that's a good place to have the battle. Right. Where CPFP stuff is just like, yeah, the more this gets used, the more it creates the problem. So <laughs> Block space, right? Uh, and, and, you know, so stuff like that is like, oh yeah, this this helps everyone. Whereas CPFP stuff is a little like, fuck you, it actually kind of hurts the whole ecosystem because now there's people working together. But you don't need the c cooperation, at, at least, right? Like that is the advantage. Oh, That's the difference between there is no the mempool, right? Um, yeah.
Yeah. So it's interesting, it's like, so CPFP is almost just at the wallet level, right? You're just spending an output in another transaction and adding more fees. RBF, you need code, technically yes in Bitcoin Core, but it's at the policy level, not the, um, uh, the consensus level, right? So that's, that's one of the real challenges with RBF is like how do we make, you're, you're trying to balance off like we want the most incentive compatible transactions to get to the miners, but, but node uh, memory space is free. So how do we make it so, and nodes are how transactions get to the miners. So how do we um, avoid that? So one way to do it is you have one centralized um, message board where people say, here's a transaction that I want to get mined. Miners go in, pick their transactions, build their blocks, and then you could say to that centralized message board, I don't want that transaction in a block anymore. Please remove it. But that's centralized. So. The miners don't need to. The miners are probably going, to, they, most of them run custom software and they're gonna run software that says like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always adopt, adapted off, but they're gonna say like, give me as many transactions as possible because for them, they just wanna get their fees, they have the scale, so they're just like, give me everything. But the nodes, not so much. And it doesn't necessarily have to go in Bitcoin Core, right? Like, so the full RBF stuff is a good example where uh, Bitcoin Knots managed by Luke Jr. He's been kind of running a version of full RBF forever um, because he just thinks that, you know, zero conf is bad and dangerous, so you should always let transactions be replaced. So that was an implementation that has existed out in the wild for a while. Um, and that's okay. It's just you're not going to have enough of those connected to miners that you can rely on that um, for, for protocol. So really it's, it's that you need Bitcoin Core you don't really need Bitcoin Core, but it's just like they're the most deployed out there um, for this, and so to, and for policy to work, you need enough. But like one of the attacks on LND, this is another interesting thing about policy versus consensus, was using a uh, an invalid opcode for uh, I think it was an opcode for for it's invalid for policy but valid for consensus, and so uh, Barat just gave this transaction directly to a miner and uh, got mined in a block and broke LND. Yeah. You don't even need that. You can just pay them by credit card and say, yeah, can you mine this transaction? I don't think they're out there, there are, yeah. <laughs> Like I was saying, the block that got mined where they burned their fees, right? Really? Yeah, I mean, the pressure goes both ways, too, right? Like, if we cannot figure out a way to make Bitcoin Core as incentive compatible as possible, then, and as fees become a more important part of minor revenue, miners will be increasingly incentivized to build it themselves because they don't trust that they're getting the best transactions. So, like, this is, like, a really important problem to solve.
and that's where we, we get to package relay, um, which is essentially, so yeah, we can go to that. Um, so that's been something that, uh, let's look at this. I think this is the optech. Um, so package relay is something that's been talked about a lot for, because one of the issues is, so yeah, a package of transactions is where you have multiple transactions that are in this graph in terms of like how their inputs and outputs are related. And one transaction on its own might not be worth it for a miner to mine, but it is if it means that they also get the revenue from the descendants and, and the other transactions in the graph. The problem is that nodes don't recognize that. We kind of look at um, the transactions in isolation. And so you can imagine, um, you know, you, you have a transaction that, you know, is involved in, in some layer two protocol and you're like, okay, well this like bunch of in inscriptions got minted and I can't, I can't get this, this transaction in anymore. Okay, I'm gonna broadcast it with this other one. The, the nodes will see the first one that the fees are too low and then drop it because it doesn't have enough space and memory in, in its mempool. And then it looks at the child that was gonna pay the fees and say, well, this is not a UTXO that exists in, 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 um, in my UTXO set, so I'm gonna drop that too. And then the miners don't see the, the, the fees that they, they could have realized from getting it. So package relay is trying to optimize a protocol by which nodes will accept uh, these packages of transactions um, in uh, incentive uh, maximized way, right? So you solve this problem where you know, one of the problems we were trying to solve with the RBF rules is this dot, DOS vector of like how much bandwidth is being taken up. And so you, you're, you're adding more data now to these transactions because there's a package of transactions and you don't know there, there's also relationships not between the, the transactions and the packages in the package itself, but the trans, like the transactions relationship to other transactions that are already in the mempool. Um, so if your package might be replacing another transaction, uh, how do you pay for the fees for that? Um, it's, uh, it's pretty gnarly. And this is a post by Gloria, yeah, this is Gloria's post on this topic where she basically proposes, well, it's a, it's a, it's a long post because one of the things that's going over, it, it kind of starts off uh, talking current RBF policy. This is a nice summary of like categories of problems being solved with the rules. One is allowing the opting out, um, which is, you know, debatable right now. Incentive compatibility, so getting, um, miners uh, as much revenue as possible, and three, DOS protection, because uh, no space is, is not, is free, basically. Um, then she goes through current attacks. So there's pinning attacks, um, which, I forget if I talked about in this talk now, it's the other thing that's gonna be a problem with me doing this four times. Um, somebody wanna explain pinning attacks? Uh, we'll do the rule three pinning attack first, which is uh, basically the absolute fee. So the idea here is if the original transaction has a very large descendant that pays a large amount of fees, um, even if it has a low fee rate, the replacement transaction must now pay those fees in order to meet rule number three. Um, so I had another link on here somewhere that talked a little bit more about that. Um, oh, this is a good one from Bitcoin Optech. So, uh, So yeah, that requires a replacement transaction, blah, blah, blah. This can allow the attacker to attach a large and low fee rate transaction to the transaction they want to pin, forcing any fee bump to pay the replacement of the large transaction. Uh, so for example, uh, with the 2019 Bitcoin Core defaults, an attacker can require an honest participant to pay a minimum of uh, 0.001 BTC to fee bump a transaction. Uh, and this was also, so this Stack Overflow uh, question, uh, here we go. So transaction, this is, a, this is a good way to step through it. So I broadcast transaction signals opt-in RBF. Transaction doesn't get confirmed because the fee rate is low. Someone else broadcasts a new child transaction spending one of the outputs of my transaction. I now can't bump the fee on the transaction unless I include a fee greater than that of the combined original transaction and the child transaction. It has to. <laughs> because it's, this is a code complexity thing where it's like, oh, this is sort of easy code that like looks through and sorts, but it doesn't, it, it also sort of implicitly thinks that like you can put as much of your blocks as you want. It doesn't necessarily abide by the standard RBF. 
and it, it's implying that because like someone has so to. But it's a ch it's a child that could pin, right? So you want to replace somebody else is paying it with a big child. Big child. Yeah. Where does the annoyance come in? Because I know, I know Peter Rule is working on a new whole new. Is he really? Yeah. Uh, but the annoyance is like there's actually there's actually ways to like exponentially blow up a property line with just a calculation, which is the his like higher order. Uh, so you need an algorithm that can like you know give him you know hundred. Yeah. Well, and you can kind of see that complexity in um, in Gloria's post, and and then the ensuing conversation because she she comes up with this idea of of a mining. So I don't know if she came up with it, but basically the idea is you're like trying to calculate the mining score of the packages and the things that are being replaced, and so that's the algorithm that comes into play here. It's like, well, how do I calculate which one is more valuable? And you're calculating the different packages. You're calculating things that are already in the mempool that might be impacted by this. Um, and it, it is just very large complexity. So um, starts having these graphs. So you can see, like, okay, I have the same size transaction with these different rates. Um, and then you can just kind of see how, um, yeah, the complexity grows and grows and grows. And as an attack, it's basically free, right? Like, because, like, if it's taking years to check that, then it's not even going to get mined. <laughs> so. Right. There are limits. Well, so RBF has descendant limits of up to 100 um, if you're doing RBF. Um, so you can't replace if there's more than 100. There's a 25 limit somewhere. Where is that? Is that in blocks or? There are limits. Yeah. But again, like the more you do that, the more the complexity grows, right? Because it's also, it's not just a linear relationship. You can have one child that has multiple descendants itself, and one of those descendants might be spending even from the original parent, and you know, how do you, you calculate all this sort of stuff? Um, and in that, it, that is relatively static, but then if you replace some of those with the new package, yeah. And then it's just like, Uh, to repeat that? Uh, something like that. So blocks do do a bit of this, obviously, because you, you're um, you have to order transactions in the most profitable way possible. Um, but again, the block template algorithm, in some sense, is simpler than the 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 RBF, I think, because. There's a cost when the when the when the transactions get in, and so you know the fees that are there. Whereas the node doesn't necessarily know okay, it might get replaced as well, and how do you deal with that? So 
and the, the mining software is almost certainly not, not like profit maximizing right now even. So even the miners are not doing it well. Based off of the broken blocks that it, are getting mined, like there is some customization, right? Um, but they'll, they'll generally like take Bitcoin Core, fork it, and and add in their own stuff. Yeah. No. It's the the chaos of decentralization. Anybody can do whatever they want, but it's risk. I mean, the way to prevent them is you make it costly. And so if somebody mined, like it's very expensive to mine a block, that is power and. I mean, this is why I'd argue, like, in a sense, proof of work is probably better because that energy is gone. It's expended. You can't get that back. The opportunity cost, what that energy could have been used for elsewhere, is gone. Uh, so the co so that's, the, that's how you prevent them, right? Is, but right now, because the software is not good enough yet, it is still, in their opinion, I guess, more, uh, they're more incentivized to try and do it themselves, even at the cost of broken blocks, um, because they think that they can optimize their their fees better. And if we take the market at its word, they, they must be right in a sense, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. Market's a bitch. It's also the miners pool. Right. Not the miners themselves. Not, most miners are pretty small upstates, but the miners pool is very, very, very undesirable. Probably right. they're very, very expensive to use for them. So they, they have to deal with that. All right. Um, um, yeah, there was a few also recently, like individual miners, or suspicion that there was some blocks mined by individual miners, which is very rare these days. Right. Yeah, so it's still unclear. It's like, ah, was this actually solo mining? But yeah. Um, all right, let's look at some of the other fee-based attacks. So this one is interesting, and I'd be curious to hear some of the opinions in the room on this. So there's, in the debate over uh, full RBF, um, there was some discussion about some of the attacks that can happen with RBF in general, and that full RBF makes it, makes it somewhat worse because you can't choose if you like want to participate in these types of options. So this was, um, the title of this is basically the free, uh, the free option attack, um, which the idea is basically that you can costlessly bet on uh, the exchange rate fluctuations and using RBF such that if you have Alice and Bob, so I'll, I'll just read it and then we can talk through it a little bit more. So specifically in a scenario with high, um, with high volatility in the exchange rate, um, and many transactions in the mempool, so high volatility exchange rate between Bitcoin and, and USD, and full mempool, so fees are also unpredictable and high, which is where RBF would come in handy. A user can make a low fee transaction and then wait for hours or days or even longer and see whether Bitcoin exchange rate moves in the direction that is beneficial to them. So the exchange rate moves up, the BTC USD moves up, a user can cancel their transaction and make a new or cheaper one. Uh, a new cheaper one. The biggest risk in accepting Bitcoin payments is in fact, according to this the, uh, post, not zero conf, which is easily to, easy to manage, but it's foreign exchange forex risk, as the merchant must commit to a certain, so the merchant commits to a certain rate ahead of time of the purchase. Now basically what would happen is that, um, so if the exchange moves up, they can cancel their transaction, make a new one uh, that's beneficial for them. If it doesn't, Okay, it settles and they don't lose anything. And the merchant, like, they, the, the, the person who is able to do that replacement, th it doesn't cost them anything to do this, whereas the merchant could charge, uh, they could charge, so you could put that in the foreign exchange, but now we're kind of like messing with the protocol and the, the market price a little bit. Um, they could also fee bump with the child pays for parent, but now who's paying that? It's, again, the merchant. Um, so. If Alice is the one that's making this bet and the merchant is Bob, uh, Bob is the only one that has to, uh, to, to take on the cost of this attack. So it's a free attack 
uh, which is not, uh, not ideal. So uh, I think one of the things that was interesting about this is that the idea that they're trying to say is that in a, uh, in an opt-in RBF world, you, you, can, you know what you're getting into. In a full RBF world, you never know if you're currently under attack for this. Go ahead. Two thousand fifteen was when it was. Yeah, and it's like we're yeah. we're not gonna do the first talk about this stuff. And you know, the the pushback is from people, you know, like Smith or other examples where it's like, look, we're using pure code and it's working. And that's the problem like that's sort of the problem is like they're like, yeah, you just basically never have profits for sure on this stuff because it's pure transactions. You sell the goods or we can add assets to the website or we do whatever. Well, you could, it, it always could work this way, but it hasn't worked this way, obviously, because like zero com, like replacement will increase if there's more full RBF, right? Like that's the reason for it, effectively. But one, one difference is there's, you can measure, right? So if you have this opt-in, you can, you can figure out what the network looks like and one of the discussions is like, well, we can actually measure our risk based off of the number of nodes that are enforcing or not enforcing this. Well, not just that. I mean, Bitcoin Knots is doing that, and some of these other forks to see full RBF is they like Peter Todd was running this thing. He was regular seeing, regularly seeing how much of the network had upgraded. So that allows you to measure your overall risk, whereas if everything is on it, uh, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a tough incentive, though, because yeah. all it takes is one time, you know, you go to one of your sub sites and you hear replace this, and then you think everyone's got transaction A, and then you get it. But that's not the business risk, right? The business risk is not at an individual level. It's how, how frequently is that possible over the course of your, your operating. Like it, it scales. Well, I mean, I, I, I would argue he said that, right? Like, he basically says, this exists in both, but it's somewhat worse at, in, in the full world, but it's a trade-off. You know, I think it's important. I don't know, a lot of times in these debates, a lot of, it's always binary, the way it's described. It's like, no, 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 there's trade-offs. It's worse in these ways. It's better in these ways. Let's decide which way, like, which world we want to live in. And you might end up in the full RBF land. Um, but what I really liked is Antoine Riard, who was originally... He like put up the code for the full RBF switch. He was like, "All right, I see this is like problematic. Here's another way you can do it, where you can like migrate, like you can have transactions opt into full RBF. Essentially, um, you signal it in the UTXO rather than tra than the transaction. And whenever this is being spent, some I think that is kind of how it worked. I forget. I, I should have put that here too. What I really like about that is that is really measurable. And so it would happen gradually, and then any service that's relying on this is." Oh crap! Like seventy percent of the UTXOs now are at least the ones that have less than a year of, of movement are like opting into this. Like I can measure this impact on my business a lot differently, and then then we would just switch on full RBF because that's the reality anyway. Um, whereas now we're kind of in this unpredictable world because it's very hard to measure as well. Um, so I think we're about at switch over time, and so thank you for everyone participating in in my the Socratic seminar. 
there are more links, so you can pick this up on the, uh, in the, in the replit. Um, we do Socratic's third Thursday of every month in Austin, and they happen all over the country and all over the world. And uh, we didn't get into ephemeral anchors and V3 transactions, but um, Gloria Zhao will be presenting on this tomorrow. Um, so this is kind of like the most promising solution to a lot of these problems. It doesn't solve everything. It's not these like full complex packages that we were discussing, um, but it simplifies a lot of the layer two protocols and the problems involved with them. So definitely check that out. Here's another thing that's really interesting. So one of the solutions that's harder to get in because it would be a consensus change is transaction sponsors. Um, and ephemeral anchors kind of, they approximate them in a policy level by doing a V3 transactions and having these zero value um, outputs. The way that transaction sponsors operate is it's basically, you can have a transaction if you imagine doing a child pays for parent without that direct link in the graph with, with the outputs, so it's not directly spending it a uh, UTXO, but you have a opcode um, that signals that says this transaction can only get mined with this parent. So if you want a fee bump, the fee bump would only go in, if both go in, if the, if the lower fee rate one goes in on its own, the other one would get just dropped from the mempool, and it totally delinks them which for businesses is really interesting because it means that businesses could fee bump on behalf of their clients without embedding that information directly into the transaction. So only if things are starting to go wrong. So um, that's like, it, it's really, imp you, exactly, and anybody can pay that too. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the user could have that in their own wallets. Well, you um, can't you can't yeah, uh, well, you, can, you know which transaction is oh, yeah, dependent on it, yeah. Um, but you don't know which UTXO you're paying for. Maybe that helps a little bit, who owns the UTXOs, right? It's not, because that, because anybody can pay for it, right? Um, and so, like, let's, so my company, Unchained, we do Bitcoin collateralized loans, we do IRAs, we do all these different things, but it's all with multi-sig. So we don't even have the benefit of, like, users have to choose their own fees because they're building their own transactions and all that sort of stuff, too. And sometimes with loans, if, um, like, the price of Bitcoin is dropping, the value of their collateral is going down, they have to top